everyone knows, um, was uh, one of the main authors of RLHF, a topic we've talked about a lot this week. Um, he was a researcher at OpenAI and I believe also a grad student at Berkeley as well. Cool. And is now, um, I guess, the founder of the Alignment Research Center. Thanks. Um, thanks for having me. Excited to talk to everyone. Yeah, so I, I did my PhD at Theory in Berkeley. I spent a couple of years at OpenAI doing more practical things. And then the last couple of years, I'm back to doing theory at the Climate Research Center. Um, today, I'm going to talk about trying to explain neural network behavior, what it means to explain neural network behavior. I wanted to give a warning that this talk mostly contains questions, doesn't have a whole lot of answers. Um, sorry. <laughs> so this is a talk about explaining neural networks. I'm going to say a little bit at the outset about why I'm interested in explaining behaviors of neural networks. Um, so right now, today, we mostly train and test neural networks as black boxes. So we estimate the quality or safety of a model by having some imperfect measurement and some particular distribution we can sample in the lab and then just testing, like actually making that measurement on that distribution, uh, which is not great from a safety perspective. Um, so in particular, we often can't predict or detect when that model might fail. Right? So in the lab, there was something true of all the data we could simulate, some properties that the model is implicitly relying on. Those could break down. Um, and if we're treating the model as a black box, we don't really get to tell it's going to happen until we see the model actually failing, which for high stakes failures is potentially not great. Um, slightly more subtly, if you have no idea how this model is working, you can't really distinguish the case where the model is operating as intended and your measurements are detecting that from the case where the model is just exploiting imperfections in your measurement. We might hope that if we could explain why a model works um, on some distribution, then we can address those challenges. So either we can say this explanation makes clear what are the preconditions for good behavior. And so we can either predict how robust they are or detect when they break down, or it can allow us to pull apart different mechanisms for good behavior so that we can distinguish them. This is sort of why I care about explanation. I think even if you don't buy this at all, I think there's lots of different reasons one could care about explaining neural networks and not love that they're black boxes. Maybe the main takeaway here is I'm mostly interested in explanation as some means to an end. Um, so as something which we're going to use to address safety challenges, rather than valuing like human understanding of models as an end in itself. That's maybe important context for the kinds of notion of explanation I'll talk about. So overall outline of the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about different things you might mean by explanation. Then I'm going to jump into talking about heuristic arguments, which I'm offering as a notion of explanation for neural net behaviors. Then I'm going to talk about the research problem of searching for a formalization of heuristic arguments, and then why you might expect explanations to exist for neural network behaviors. So I'm going to consider a toy setting. So I imagine we have some known target function G. Uh, we train a neural network to approximate that function. Uh, maybe you imagine G is like, here's a SAT instance, one if it's satisfiable, zero if it's not satisfiable. And then we're given some set of parameters of the trained model, which in fact has high accuracy. So someone hands me like these billion numbers. And I would like to explain why it is that, say, a transformer with those particular billion parameters has high accuracy on this task. So I say this is a toy setting. The way in which it's toy is that I know the target function G. Right? So often in the real world, we'll have something that depends on unknown facts about the world, like some data distribution I don't really understand. But the nice thing about this toy setting is that I have a precisely defined statement that I'm trying to explain. Right? So I can have a formal definition of the data distribution, a formal definition of the function G, and then the actual neural net sitting in front of me. So this is just a nice, precisely specified fact, mathematical fact that I want to explain. Um, I think that does simplify some things I'm going to discuss, but I think the basic challenges of explaining neural network behavior do arise, or many important ones arise in this case. I think it would be very useful to be able to handle this case. I'm not going to talk at all about a real unknown data distribution. Yeah. So or just to make sure I kind of like understand what you have in mind here. So if I could do that for this G, would that basically give me a proof that P equals NP? Uh, it depends what we mean by explanation. So I mean, if I had, in fact, a very high accuracy, then that would give me a proof P equals NP. This model is not going to have super high accuracy, right? If I train a SAT model on like 1,000 instances, like 1,000 clause SAT instances, it will get some accuracy, right? Maybe it has like 50% accuracy, depends on the distribution. Um, this would be a very hard function to, to learn. And you probably would have some, you know, is as high as it is will depend or how impressed you are. It's going to be more than 50%, hopefully, 70% or whatever. OK, so then it would be like, but it would give you like an algorithm for uh, attaining that like performance. Uh, so we have our neural net, which is hopefully an algorithm. And then this would, I don't know what an explanation would do. So what I'm, I'm not going to discuss is like, what might we mean by explanation? Um, so the first, the first notion I'll talk about, I'm happy to revisit if it doesn't answer the question at the end. But 
the, the first notion I'll talk about is just an explanation of something you give to a human that helps the human sort of feel like they understand why or how the model works. In some sense, this is like the natural pre-theoretic notion. This is like what you would come in with if, you, if you're just seeking an explanation. Um, so sort of stylizing how this might work, you could imagine assigning meanings to neurons or directions in a model in activation space. Look at how those neurons or directions are related to each other by the weights of a model. Tell some story that makes sense about why those activations, like relationships, lead to solving the problem, and then maybe validate that story by doing some experiments. So this image is from the Still Circuits thread from Chris Ola's team at OpenAI a couple years ago. Um, here on the left, we have some directions or neurons in layer 4B, which they hypothesize represent windows, the bodies of cars, and wheels. On the right, we have some neuron that I think represents cars. You can look at the weights connecting these neurons to each other and say, okay, windows, if they're above the car, excite the car detector. Wheels, if they're below the car, to cite the car detector, excite the car detector. We can tell a story that makes sense to us about why this results in a better car detector, or like why this means that the model will solve this task, ultimately, of classifying cars. Sort of a paradigm example of someone trying to look at a model, trying to make sense of what it's doing, and tell some story that leads to a human feeling like they understand why this model, this particular set of whatever it is, 100 million weights, leads to solving the task. Um, you can also imagine doing that in this choice setting I described, like for an algorithmic task. So if you imagine you have some transformer trained to do, in this case, an extremely simple task. So given two numbers, A and B, compute their sum mod P. You could imagine someone handing you the weights of that model. They tell you, like, look, 99% of the time on randomly chosen A and B, if you feed those into this transformer, you get out their sum mod P. And you could try and explain why. And you might end up writing some you know, diagram of this form. Uh, you say like, okay, here's a story about how the model represents the values A and B, and here we can look at the like set of weights or the transformations implemented by the model, and we can tell some story why implementing those transformations would allow you to solve this task. A human can read that and say, okay, I'm kind of convinced, or they might then do some experiments. So like, well, that suggests if I do the following ablation, the model will stop working. Um, at the end of the day, it's not exactly clear what like the formal type signature of this object is, but it's something you told a human. A human comes away feeling like they understand what's going on and why this model works. So I'm pretty excited about research of this form. I really don't like that neural networks are treated as black boxes. I would really love trying to understand what's going on inside them. I think there are some problems. Right? So one obvious problem is I don't really know what understand means. I think none of us collectively like know that well what I mean by understand in any of the sentences I just said, um, which makes it a little bit hard to validate progress or to scale progress or think about how we automate this work or what we're doing. Um, a related question is, is it even possible to get whatever understanding means when models don't think in a way that humans would recognize? Like, we don't already know what algorithm we're looking for. Um, can you break big models down into small pieces and so on? So I think these are fairly severe problems in practice. To me as a theorist, they're like really bad problems. I want to talk about like properties of understanding. And that's very hard to do when it's defined by reference to how a human would feel. This is sort of one option for what it means to understand or explain how a neural network works. Um, I'm mostly going to talk about other options, but I think understanding this one is important because this is sort of the state of to the extent that we explain how models work, this is the thing I most, I most love or like most gets at what I'm going for as it exists in the world right now. Okay, so I'm mostly going to talk about other notions. So a, a second option is just to prove that the model works. Right, so I told, gave you this very simple algorithmic task. This statement is perfectly well defined. I can say, what's the probability if I sample A and B at random and then I hand them to this transformer and then I decode its output, what's the probability that it will be A plus B mod P? Um, in fact, that probability is pretty large, you know, more than 99%. I could try and prove that fact. Uh, I give several question marks on proof because I think there's a very, very large gap between the kind of understanding that we have when we're looking at a neural network and, and trying to, say, write a paper about interpretability and the kind of understanding that actually goes into a proof. I think this thing, this diagram is not that close to a proof of the statement. But you could imagine going along these lines, making, proving some lemmas about how the activations relate to the numbers A and B, building those up, as you move through the model until ultimately you actually have a proof of this theorem. Yeah? Uh, for this specific theorem, if we are able to sample A and B at random, like we can just throw an IID sample from the distribution and verify the statement? Yeah, so there's, you can imagine, there's this tricky distinction. Like if I want to know how good is my model on a distribution which I can sample in the lab, I think the way you do it is you just sample A and B and you just check. And in some sense, that's very analogous to what we do with neural nets most of the time. We can just treat them as a black box, sample some inputs, measure the properties of the input-output behavior. Um, so what we seek from an explanation, or what I am interested in, is something that allows me to like, understand, for example, what were the conditions that caused the model to work, or distinguish different reasons that the model might have a property. And this is kind of what we might hope we get if a human is looking at the model and understanding what's going on. 
Um, it's unclear. Maybe if you get that with a proof, I'll just turn to that in one second. But I do think it's the case that sampling does not give you a proof of this theorem. Right? So you're not going to be able, if you sample, you will get some convincing evidence of this, of this fact, but you will not get a proof. Well, for you, is a proof strictly better than an explanation, or are they incomparable? Uh, so I'm going to offer proof as like an option for what an explanation is. I think from my perspective, a proof would be a useful form of explanation. So I think a proof does do this thing of like making explicit the assumptions that were required for the conclusion to hold. So that you can say detect if they fail, or reason about how robust those assumptions are. I think it's more subtle, but a proof does allow you to like tease apart different mechanisms or like understand some, in some intuitive sense why this happens. I mean, there are proofs that are famously unilluminating, right? Yeah, so I'd say there's a question of illuminating to whom. Right. The proof is very illuminating to the proof verifier and not yes. very illuminating to me right. Right. as a human. And so by moving from option one to option two, I have given up on humans understanding these explanations. Right. And in particular, I think proofs of neural network behaviors, if we were able to get them, would be exceptionally incomprehensible. And so the proof of like a property of GPT-4 is going to be you know, hundreds and hundreds of billions of pages, just number after number after number. Yeah, so I agree in this toy setting, I can say exactly what the property is. In reality, I don't know what exactly I mean. Um, like, what does it mean to say that GPT-4 has some property? Maybe a couple things. For the purpose of this talk, I'm mostly going to focus on this case where we know the theorem setting. I think it would be reasonable to say I'm eliding some part of the difficulty, and we could debate whether that's most of the difficulty or half the difficulty or some fraction. I think there are a lot of useful things you can do even in context where you know the theorem statement. So, like, for example, understanding the relationships between different models. Like, if you have your you know, GPT-4 and GPT-3 thinking for a long time, there's, there are theorem statements that are interesting about the relationships between them. Um, I'm, I'm probably not going to dig into it and just say, like, I'm giving up whatever fraction I'm giving up by, by thinking about this twice setting where I do know the statement. So a problem that looms large when one's considering proofs is just, is there any short proof of the behaviors we're interested in? Um, I don't really think you have any theoretical reason to expect to be entitled to a short proof of interesting model behaviors. I think there's actually a pretty good theoretical case that there often won't be a short proof. Um, in practice, it's been extremely hard. I don't think anyone has really proven any interesting facts about interesting models, essentially other than like robustness to local perturbations, or we could talk about what's interesting. But most facts similar to like this toy statement, like people can't prove. Um, so I think I would be interested in proofs. I think proofs show a certain kind of understanding of how the model works and would help for certain kinds of problems posed by you neural know, nets being black boxes. And the problem is just they don't exist um, or may not exist. So instead, in this talk, I'm going to consider a third option, which is I'm going to call a heuristic argument that the model works. And by this, I mean some kind of deductive argument which follows like formal rules of the game, similar in kind to the rules of proof, but which does not give you perfect confidence in the conclusion. So per proof just settles the question. For example, if you prove a model works, you kind of have proven there's no back doors, you've proven there's no other gotchas. We're going to talk about arguments which give you prima facie reason to think something is true. That's going to be the whole rest of the stock. So I'm going to start by talking about an example, um, one of the simplest possible examples. So imagine that someone has given me the following hard question. If I sample an integer x at random between 1 and n, what's the probability that x and x plus 2 are both prime? This is a classic example of an easy question for which I'm extremely unlikely to get a proof, or it's very, very hard to get a proof. But we can certainly make an effort to compute this probability. Right? I can say I know the probability x is prime. It's about 1 over log n by the prime number theorem. I can easily compute x plus 2 is prime with probability 1 over log n. I'm wondering about the probability that both of these things are true simultaneously. I have no idea. I don't know whether they're positively correlated or negatively correlated or what. But I could make a default estimate of just assume the correlation is zero, since I don't know if it's positive or negative, and call it 1 over log squared n. My claim I'm going to make is this gives you a good first pass reason to guess 1 over log squared n is the answer to this question. So this estimate, unlike a proof, is subject to revision. I'll say defeasible. So for example, if I notice facts about the relationship between x is prime and x plus 2 is prime, that will change this default estimate. Unlike a proof, this was just a default that I can move from. For example, if x is prime, then x plus 2 is almost certainly odd. So the probability that x plus 2 is prime is actually about 2 over log n. The probability that a random odd number is prime. That's a better guess than 1 over log n. So 2 over log squared n is a better estimate than my original 1 over log squared n. If I notice another relationship, I'll keep revising that estimate. It is just rules of the game for someone giving me considerations and me revising my estimate in terms of or based on the considerations they've handed me. And keep doing. I think this game eventually settles down at like 1.32 to over log squared n. It's the best estimate after you integrate all the considerations like this. 
we can think of, which does agree with experiment, is probably the right estimate. So this kind of defeasible probabilistic reasoning is really common once you're looking for it. So I think it's perhaps simplest in number theory, like in this example of twin prime conjecture, where I can take random models for the prime numbers or for the solutions to Diophantine equations, or more often just random ad hoc models. I think you can answer sort of the majority of, you can settle most conjectures in number theory on the basis of this kind of heuristic argument. Um, physicists are in the business of computing things that they can't prove. It's not just because physicists are lazy and don't like writing down proofs. It's because the kinds of methods they use actually often don't correspond to proofs. They correspond to reasons to think that the estimate is one way or another, which could be overturned later, and on rare occasions are overturned later. Um, if you have some complicated dynamical system and you want to reason about it, the way you reason about it is often by treating what is even a deterministic system as stochastic and using this kind of independence assumption. So the thing I want to emphasize is these are not Monte Carlo estimates. So all of these are like deductive arguments that reason from premises to conclusions by saying, you know, here's the relationship between this and that, rather than just sampling a bunch of primes x and checking how often x plus 2 is prime. So this is a category of reasoning that is very different from Monte Carlo estimates. Monte Carlo estimates sort of what we do in neural network training. This is something which is structurally closer to a proof, although the level of competence is, is way lower. So if you look at all these arguments, like the kinds I mentioned on the last slide, they tend to share a lot of common structure. So you can cast them as basically deductively valid arguments that treat unknown quantities as random, even if they're deterministic, and that use some simple heuristics to estimate the expectations of those quantities. So perhaps the simplest heuristic is if I don't know anything about how A and B are related, and I want to estimate the expectation of the product, I just treat it as the product of the expectations. Just assume the correlation is zero by default. In the primes example, we applied this with x is prime and x plus 2 is prime. A slightly more complicated heuristic is that if I know about some factor z, which is related both to a and b, for example, suppose I know the co covariance of z with a and I know the covariance of z with b, rather than assuming that a and b are independent, I can assume that the residual, if I regress onto z, is independent. So I can say, suppose z is one consideration that drives the relationship between them. I don't know if you really want to be able to verify this equation, but I'm saying the covariance between A and B, a good default guess is covariance of A with Z times the covariance of Z with B divided by the variance of Z. Um, so this is what we did in the case of the prime number theorem with the, with the intermediate Z being X is odd, because we understand how that Z drives both the primality of X and the primality of X plus two. So the nice thing, or like a, a suggestive thing about like these estimates across many domains is they seem to use just a few simple heuristics of this form, especially this bottom one. Those suffice to get reasonable best guesses in a really broad range of domains. And this leads to the following conjecture that motivates our current work, that all these heuristic arguments are instances of some simple general formalism rather than a bunch of domain-specific tricks that work well in practice. That is, it's not the case that there's a magical fact about the prime numbers, that the prime numbers behave as if they were a random set. It's the case that there are some general principles of reasoning, which, if applied to the prime numbers, yield these estimates. So by analogy, logical deduction is a simple formalism that's very broadly applicable. When you're reasoning logically, the hard part is like finding proofs. The hard part is not verifying that a proof is correct. We hope the same thing will be true here, right? That this reasoning across many domains can be unified in a single simple formalism. The difficulty is finding arguments, not verifying arguments. Why well, I think that's plausible. Um, I think the first reason I've already given, these arguments seem to have a very simple and general structure, even across many domains. You can put them in this common framework. They don't seem to be a bunch of ad hoc rules that you have to empirically verify separately. Another important point is they seem to work by default. So the story seems to be often these arguments go wrong, but when they go wrong, it's because there is a specific reason that they should fail. For example, you would incorrectly estimate the probability that x and x plus 2 are both prime, but someone can point out to you the structure that you missed. And you can approach the correct answer as you notice more and more relevant structure. Do you necessarily mean like interval structures to human? Uh, I basically only mean structure for which you can calculate. And so somehow you've recursively estimated something about the relationship between A and Z and Z and B. And then you may have no understanding of what Z is, but it is simpler and they're able to compute these relationships. Okay. I so I don't mean, I don't mean structure that makes sense to humans. I only mean structure that makes sense to the rules of this game. I see. I see. Okay, so now stepping back and talking about what we're looking for, what I would like to have, we're searching for a sort of simple program analogous to a proof verifier, which I'm going to denote as G. 
which takes as input some formally defined quantity x. You might use the twin prime density or the accuracy of some neural network on some distribution. A set of observations or arguments that are relevant to estimating that quantity x. Imagine these is like someone points out if x is prime, x plus 2 is more likely to be prime. Someone points out a pattern in the weights of a model or about the activations of a model. And output some best guess about the quantity x, which behaves like a subjective expectation. So it behaves as if it was the expected value of an unknown quantity or random quantity x, even though an x maybe, in fact, is a well-defined number. It's just some deterministic number, but we're uncertain about it. If we had such a g, then we could cast this goal of explaining neural network behavior as finding some pi such that it causes g to be have an accurate estimate of the accuracy of your neural network, whatever property you're interested in explaining. Right? We're saying, how is it? what does it mean to explain the fact that f theta and g agree? One candidate for what it means to explain is to find a pi, this kind of probabilistic defeasible argument that leads you to a correct guess about the probability that f theta and g agree. Yeah? So if I wanted to implement this g, I guess uh, one thing I could try to do is just train an LLM to be g. You could just train a language model to be G. I could just uh, give you a bunch of labels of uh, whether X is true or not. So I guess how happy would you be with such a G? Uh, it wouldn't thrill me, but I think it could still be useful. I think this would kind of take you to the same place. So if you say just like train a neural nets implement G, this is a very similar place to like human interpretability research. Maybe it's a bit better to the extent that human interpretability research isn't that grounded to the predictions and you could really grind things through. We have similar questions of how does it generalize and like can we apply it in cases where we don't have training data and so on. Um, so I would be interested, but I would really love to have a G for which we understand why it works in the same way that like we kind of trust logical deduction way out of distribution. I would love to have a have a thing where we understand why it works and can trust it way out of distribution. Well, in this formulation, it seems to depend on like how you choose a P, like the probability of X. Right? Like you're choosing what distribution you are. You're choosing what distribution you're evaluating the accuracy of this formalism, right? That's right. And then you want to comment on that, like how we should choose that distribution? Yeah, so it's the typical setting here is you have some phenomenon you can observe in the lab. So in the lab, you have something, some experiment you can run to suggest that your model is safe or is competent or whatever. Uh -huh. And what we're going to do is instead of just running with the output of that experiment, we're going to try and explain why that happened. So you're going to say, okay, for this distribution in the lab, which I can write like precisely, here's why the model works. And then the hope is with that explanation in hand, we can then go in the real world and we can say, okay, this does or does not actually meet the preconditions. I can look at that explanation and say, here's why the model worked on that distribution. Here were the important parts of that distribution that caused it to work. Okay. Um, so this would be, this property is just some behavior which we can define formally or we can actually conduct in the lab. I see, but what if like, when we deploy the system, the distribution is inevitably very different from what's in the lab? Yes. In some sense, if it wasn't different, I wouldn't care about any of this. If it wasn't different from what you can do in the lab, I'd say just test in the lab and work with the empirics. And so the, yeah. the, point, the point, I mean, you could have different things you want out of explanation. And so I'm happy for different people to want explanations for different reasons. And some may be unsatisfied with this notion of explanation. But I'm interested because an explanation, for example, lets you just say, like, here's why the model works. Now in a new input, we can test whether like, that argument breaks down. Like, can we test whether that explanation breaks down? Relevant observations or arguments based on what you The question is, can we constrain the like choice of these pi i's to be things that are definitely relevant? Yeah. Um, I think the idea is relevance is kind of defined by whether it moves G's view. So I'm happy to say, like, it's fine if you throw some irrelevant observations in here. Those just won't change won't change G's view about x. So, like, essentially, G will then choose like whether pi is. Relevant. That's right. G is just taking in all these observations or observations about the weights of a model. And if you're like, hey, have you noticed this weight is like exactly 0 0.3? G will be like, I don't care about that or I don't understand how that bears on the, the question I'm estimating. Yeah. Is this similar to like mean field analysis or kind of analogous to it or a generalization of it? Yeah, I think the idea would be that this like mean field analysis is an example of this kind of reasoning where it gives you like, here's a best guess, a reasonable guess, ignoring some like higher level correlations or like fine grained correlations. Um, and so we hope that you could then take that analysis and just throw it in and say, here's the mean field analysis, and then G will output the, will agree with the mean field analysis until some new considerations come in. Yeah. Uh, so I just want to make sure I kind of understand what Pi is supposed to be doing. So, um, you know, like, let's take this example uh, from my talk where, you know, there's a spam data set where, like, URL, presence of URL is highly correlated with spam. Yeah. Like, uh, 
and then we like ask, okay, why is this spam detector doing a good job? And Pi is like, ah, because like uh, URL, like one, like Pi brings up some consideration of like URL is highly correlated with uh, the class label, and the model looks at whether there's a URL, and then you would use this to say, ah, okay, there's like a problem because uh, I could imagine some other distribution where this is not true, and I thought it probably wouldn't work. Is this kind of how yeah. it that, that's a great example. Hopefully people heard it. That's a great example and like how we'd like this to work. So this phenomenon could be something like in the lab, I have some data set. I can confirm that on that data set, my model is successfully predicting whether something is spam. I can try and explain why that fact is, which might be pointing out like, oh, here is a feature which is large on the spam data set and small on the non-spam data set and which the model is successfully picking up on. And then the hope is this has given me, I've now, the thing I created was like a statement of what it was about the data set or some statement about what it was about the data set that caused my model to work. This example is subtle because of this, like you can't, once you're working with the empirical data set, th things become a little bit more messy, but that's the basic idea, what we want to happen in the end. A typical version of pi would be here is the empirical average of some quantity over some, some finite set. It's a totally valid thing. So just stepping back and summarizing this hope, like I would love to prove things about neural networks. Um, I don't think it solves all our problems, but I think it is a big step from black boxes. I think that seems pretty much completely intractable to me. Um, that said, there's lots of domains where proving things is intractable. Neural networks are not unique. Pretty much any interesting system, it's impossible to prove things about. Um, and diffusible probabilistic reasoning is pretty common and successful, even in many domains where proofs are intractable. Um, I am concerned that it's somewhat hard to scale this kind of informal reasoning to neural networks, where we're used to dealing with proofs or arguments that are, say, 10 pages or 100 pages long, whereas an interesting proof of, say, G property of GPT-4 would be more like billions of pages. That's not the kind of thing where you can get by on like a approximately correct understanding. And so the hope is that if we could formalize this kind of reasoning by like actually constructing an estimator G, that may make it possible to explain neural networks in a sense that would at least be useful for some downstream applications. So by default, the rest of this talk will just be digging in on this problem of trying to formalize it in estimator G. To take any other motivation or like why are you even talking about this questions at this point um, we'll just be moving more into the weeds now yeah um so there's a complicated question is can we think of general relativity as like an estimator or like an approximate argument or something about the physical world I think the big complexity here is you're sort of mixing together two kinds of things when you talk about, right, when you do physics, you're mixing together two kinds of two kinds of practice. One is understanding what kinds of laws describe the world. Another is understanding sort of logical consequences or like how does, how does this model work? What model is a good approximation to another model? And I think the thing we're talking about here is more about understanding like when is one theory a good approximation to another theory and less about understanding like scientific questions about how the world operates, um, which is a lot of what physics does now, but maybe less of what physics did in the, the early 20th century. And I'm going to talk about the problem of searching for an estimator. Um, so roughly speaking, our goal right now is searching for some simple program G, analogous to a proof verifier, that formalizes existing informal arguments, satisfies natural coherence properties, and formalizes something called a no-coincidence principle, um, which is roughly going to be why we expect it to be possible to interpret neural networks. I'm going to talk about these in the rest of the talk. The most straightforward is formalizing existing informal arguments. So they said this kind of reasoning is everywhere. I think we have like something like 100 or a couple hundred examples of informal heuristic arguments that a particular quantity takes on a particular value. And often we don't expect those arguments to be overturned by new considerations. So some examples are, I described this argument that the twin prime density is 1.32 dot 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 over log squared n. So that's like a case where we have an informal argument. We know what the answer is supposed to be. So we would think that a formal system should capture that conclusion. Similarly, we have an argument that the probability of a hash collision in SHA-256 for randomly chosen documents is 2 to the negative 256. And we don't expect to revise that estimate significantly based on new considerations. So our hope is for any case where we have such an informal argument, there is an, a formal version of the argument. So if I hand it to G, it reaches the right conclusion, even if I also hand a large number of spurious arguments. So if I have a formal argument, the twin prime density should be 1.32. I should be able to give a formalization of that argument to G, 
So it's no matter what else you tell G, it keeps arriving at the correct answer. So I would be very happy if we could define such a G. And if you had such a G, you might hope that then you could take informal arguments about neural networks and also submit them in the same way to G and get reasonable conclusions that match the kinds of conclusions a human would think are justified from those arguments. Are you assuming that C is the true answer? Uh, I think we often don't know. It was just like cases where it would be a big deal to notice that C wasn't right. It's like for the twin prime conjecture, I don't know if the real density is 1.32, but it's like I would be a famous number theorist if I had a reason to think it was anything different. So whether or not it's the truth, I think it's the answer that, that G should come to. That's Emily for Shaw. I don't know. Maybe Shaw has a bunch of collisions, but... I don't know. That would be a big deal if I was to explain so that fact. So you're happy if your heuristic argument system just converges on some answer? Uh, yeah, I think we have some intuitions, and we'll talk about coherence properties. Yeah. I think we have some informal. The, the reason I'm motivated to explore this is because we have some informal examples that seem very accurate in practice or like surprisingly effective in practice um, and feel intuitively valid. And so I'm very happy if we just construct a formal object that is agreeing with what feels intuitively valid in simple cases. So we can then try and apply it in more complex cases, like analyzing a, a neural network. Yeah. Is, is the, the, time, the time would be on your problem? Yeah, this pi star that's supposed to be, if we have an informal argument, we hope it's very easy to turn that into a formal argument. Like ideally, it's analogous to formalizing an informal proof. So if you give me, a, like I think a thing, a property our proof system should have is if you hand me a math paper, I should be able to turn that into a formal proof with like linear but considerable effort. I'm asking you back if you just apply yourself and you you increase the the argument to be fine for the problem yourself, you want to have like yeah, so the question is, given x, can you find pi? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think no, it's going to be really hard. That's going to be very analogous to finding proofs, where like given a true statement, it's very hard to find a proof of the statement. So the, the easy part is verifying it. So analogously, if we succeed at this, it will not it will not resolve the entire problem of interpreting neural networks. It will just give you a formal standard for like here is here's a machine which takes you give your interpretation to. You can you can spit out a number. So I'm going to talk about an example problem to ground a little bit of the, the rest of the talk. Um, so for a matrix n by n matrix A, we can define the permanent as the sum over permutations of the product of the entries in the assisted diagonal. So it's like, like the determinant, but drop the signs. Um, estimating permanence is very hard. Uh, even approximating permanence is very, very hard. But it is possible, given a matrix, to make all kinds of informal, intuitively valid heuristic arguments. Um, for example, if I know the average value in each row, well, the permanent is just a sum of n factorial terms, one per permutation. Each of those terms is a product of one entry per row. So if I know the average value in each row and I multiply those, that gives me a reasonable estimate for the contribution from a random permutation. And if I multiply that by n factorial, I get some kind of estimate for the permanent of a matrix. So this can be either justified from the kind of simple reasoning rules I sketched out before. This is basically one application of that basic presumption of independence heuristic. You can also check that if you feed in like random matrices, this thing is going to have lower squared error than guessing zero or whatever. Analogously, if I know the column averages, I can get an estimate that way. If I consider some finite set of permutations over which I can compute the sum, so the permanent is the sum over all permutations. If I take that sum over some finite set of permutations, that also gives me a reasonable best guess estimate for the permanent. So all of these are quite bad estimates in the sense that they will only reduce your error a little bit compared to just guessing zero. Um, but they are intuitively valid and, in fact, do reduce your error if you're trying to guess permanent on a random matrix. Uh, did you mean to scale your perm as a value by an appropriate scaling factor? Uh, no. No. Great. So the permanent is just the sum over all permutations. I'm kind of just taking a subsum, a subset of the terms in that sum, and then I'm dropping every other term as zero. Uh, all right, fine. So you could instead scale by, say, consider how many of the terms I took. If you do that, you'll actually get a much worse squared error than just outputting zero. Okay. Um, so it's actually not correct in this case to scale it up. Fine, fine. All right. This is a bummer because it's like the permanence like two to the million and you're giving an estimate of like 17. Yeah. It's not a great estimate. And similarly, if we can factor the matrix A, then we know the permanent is non-negative. We can factor as VV transpose. We know the permanent is non-negative. Um, we can also get more subtle information from this kind of factorization. The point is like we have a domain. We have a large number of informal arguments. You can kind of understand intuitively, or we can make good intuitive arguments about what these, what your estimates should be based on this data. We like to have a formal object that kind of formalizes all of these conclusions, and you can hand these arguments in and get out the anticipated answer. 
so part of this, we want, we want to find this G, which captures like reasonable best guesses based on the arguments that have been supplied. Uh, we expect that a reasonable G should satisfy a bunch of very simple coherence properties. So if you're talking about your best guesses, one property they ought to have is they should be linear. So if I ask G to estimate like what's the sum of F of X over every X, I should get the same answer as if I go through each X independently, ask G to estimate F of X for each one and add those up. This is like a very natural property. Obviously, expectations satisfy this property. Um, it's reasonable to expect best guesses to satisfy it. This is actually an incredibly stringent property. Um, so trying to do this while capturing informal arguments is very, very hard. Um, it's also a fairly important property in the end for applications to neural networks. So if you don't, if your G doesn't have this property, it's much harder to do anything with it. It doesn't give you the notion of explanation, which I want. That shouldn't be obvious. Similarly, we think that the notion of heuristic arguments should generalize the notion of proof. So if I have a proof that a quantity X is greater than C, then no matter what else someone tells me, so for any other pi prime, I should still estimate that X is going to be at least C. If I have a proof that X is more than C, it would be bad if my estimate for X was less than C. That would be like a violation of being intuitively reasonable. And we can go on like this, or you can write down a bunch of reasonable properties. Here's some iterate expectation property that's just exactly analogous to a property that holds for conditional expectations, which we would like to hold if we're going to interpret this object as like a subjective expectation. So I've said one of our desiderata was trying to capture informally, informal, intuitively valid arguments. Another desideratum is trying to match this kind of coherence property. So try, I think, in fact, we cannot find any function G that satisfies these three properties. If you make these properties a little bit stronger, you can prove that it's impossible. But a simple question itself contained is just, is there a G that satisfies these properties? And a lot of our time is seeking such an object. So is this like, this is like an open mathematical question? That's right. Constructing some polynomial time computable G, which has the following three properties. Oh, wait, sorry, this is like not formal though, because we don't know what pi is. You are allowed to choose the type signature of pi. It just has to be a superset of proofs. So if I took pi to be proofs, then couldn't I do this with G as any theorem? Uh, so this will, you could try and take pi to be any proof, but then you still have to define like, suppose I have a proof that the average number of primes is one over log n, or like I have my proof of the prime number theorem, that the fraction of numbers that are prime is one over log n, I then can still ask G, what's the probability that one of like x and x plus two are both prime? And those answers are going to be constrained by linearity and by iterated expectations. And so if I take the constraints just from getting the answers to proofs correct, plus the constraints from linearity and iterated expectations, it's very hard to meet all of those properties at once. Um, but not so hard we can show it's impossible. In fact, we think it's possible. We can't find like a counterexample. These properties are kind of been calibrated just to the level where it looks like they should hold. Probably the space of valid pi is going to be larger than the space of proofs, but you can take it to just be proofs. So, like, suppose that we say that such a G exists, but like, so, but empirically, when we actually try to implement G, there's no guarantee that the, the thing that there's no way to find out whether the thing that we implement is actually the G that we prove to be exists. Uh, yeah, at the end of the day, we're going to have some particular G and going to try and hopefully we'll argue that G has these, has these properties. Oh, okay, That's okay, what we'd like okay, to get. Yeah, exactly. And then we would use this as part of this uh, downstream. Yeah, once we have our explanation of a neural net, we can feed it to this G, and then we can talk about how we would actually use that to solve safety problems, which I'm not discussing here. Yeah, so I, I described one open question, which is just formalizing these intuitively valid arguments. This is precisely defined, but only with respect to a database of intuitively valid arguments. This question stands on its own to a greater extent. It's just, can you find a G that has these properties? To give like the flavor of the challenge here, I think it's normally very simple to say what you should do in response to a single argument. So I've said like, if you know the product of the row averages is say 187, your estimate for the permanent should be about 187 times n factorial. This is kind of a reasonable default guess if we just make this presumption of independence over and over again. Then we have harder questions if we ask, okay, what if I know the product of the rows is 187, the product of the row averages, but the product of the column averages is negative 384, right? It's not obvious. If I want to satisfy the kind of properties on the last slide, how I should integrate these two different kinds of information to make a best guess. I mean, I'm not going to, it turns out that the reasoning, these heuristics I described on the first slide do allow you to pin down an answer to this. You actually just add your estimates. Someone can check that's like a good estimate or it has lower squared error. You can keep going. You can compute a sum. Okay, what do I do then? The answer is you use your value of the sum for the permutations you actually computed, use your default estimate for the remaining permutations, which you didn't compute, 
It's okay if none of these numbers make that much sense. The point is this is the kind of challenge we face. We understand what individual arguments should do. We need to reason about how you combine different arguments. This becomes much, much harder once I introduce, so I was able to merge these three arguments. If I add one more argument that my matrix has this factorization, it's no longer clear how to merge that with the other arguments. And this is probably the simplest case where we're unsure what the right answer should be. And so this is the kind of algorithmic problem we're spending our time mostly focusing on. So, Paul, I mean, one question that we thought about in the context of boson sampling, actually, was uh, suppose that you've given a matrix, like you know various row sums, and you also know various column sums. Right, how should you use those to best approximate the permanent? And you know, our best suggestion was that uh, do Sinkhorn scale it, right? So just you know, but basically normalize you know the rows, normalize the columns, and so forth. And so you, uh, you get these you know these rows and these columns, and then you, know, you find the best estimate. Yeah, but yeah, I, I, I don't know if that would be the right generalization in this case. Yeah, I think that this iterative scaling process. But. Even these questions where you just yeah. have data about row and column sums are already interesting and non-trivial. Yeah. Yeah. So I gave this as like a reasonable answer. This is kind of the first past dumbest answer, and you can definitely do significantly better than this. Um, like if you condition additional information about further computations that you perform, you should be able to get better estimates. I'm pretty interested in talking about that in particular and like where you ended up on that. Yeah. So in this case, an interesting feature is like this estimate must be non-negative. Right, we have a proof that because it has this factorization, it's permanent is non-negative. But the actual quantitative considerations I have at hand are going to end up with a negative estimate if n is large. So it's really unclear what I do. Right? In this case, it's very, it's very unclear how to merge these different estimates. I could truncate negative estimates to zero in order to generalize proofs. But if I do that, then I will violate linearity and the severe expectation property. Again, it's OK if this slide mostly just kind of seems like numbers. This is the flavor of challenge, though. Um, so those were the first two properties, one formalizing intuitively valid arguments and one um, respecting coherence properties. I'm not going to talk about a third desideratum, which is maybe more philosophically interesting. This comes from a paper Gowers wrote earlier this year. He proposed this principle that if an apparently outrageous coincidence happens in mathematics, then there is a reason for it. So for example, if you were to find that at some point there stopped being twin primes, there are only finitely many of them, then the claim is that's an outrageous coincidence which would demand an explanation. Is there would have to be something someone could tell you about why there are only finitely many twin primes. Whereas the twin prime conjecture does not demand an explanation. That's just a very obvious natural thing to happen. This is a totally informal statement, but I think it's actually a pretty convincing empirical regularity. So it has often been the case in the history of mathematics that people discover that something that appears like an outrageous coincidence happens, and then the mathematician set to work trying to understand why. Like, why is this Fourier coefficient the same as the size of this group representation? And Pretty much always, we end up with an understanding that makes sense. Yeah. Do you know whether that empirical observation is subjective to like survival bias, where like people are more likely to like find like explanation for coincidence? Or... In my sense, is it's mostly like there's an anti-survivorship bias here. So if you imagine someone has discovered an outrageous coincidence which has no explanation whatsoever, that just becomes this very interesting object for study. Okay. There are some like kind of weird domains where this sort of thing happens more. And it's true that domains where things don't work out nicely are less likely to be studied. So there's some room for it. Um, I've spent some time seeking. And it's actually, there are like a few candidate counterexamples now. But I think it's like, it's pretty sparse. Okay. Um, so I, I find this like a very natural, interesting conjecture, even though it's informal. Like I would love, apart from any application to neural nets, to understand how to formalize the statement um, and whether it's actually true. It's just like a very nice thing to be true. Um, for the purpose of this talk, I want to just translate that into the language of this heuristic estimation. So I'm going to say that a statement is an outrageous coincidence if G thinks its probability is less than 2 to the negative length of the statement. Um, and the reason I've defined it this way is that if our probabilities were calibrated, then there should not be even a single statement of this form, which ends up being true. Right? If I take 2 to the negative length of statements summed up over every statement, that's only 1. So if, these prob if any proposition has probably significantly less than that, then by a union bound, I expect none of them to be true. So not a single outrageous coincidence should occur. Maybe I'm missing something. Why is it the length of this statement? Okay, it's only to make this line true. The only reason I chose that was like, if you cherry pick like really complicated statements, you can find coincidences that happen to be true. Like if I consider a space of a trillion trillion statements, I'd be able to find one coincidence, which had a prior probability of only a trillion trillion. But if I'm only looking at 30-bit statements, there's only a billion of them, probably I shouldn't be able to find anything that has prior probability less than one in a billion. 
think that was a good question to clarify. Well, the converse of this is basically just this no coincidence principle. If something looks like an outrageous coincidence, it's because you're missing something. There's some explanation for why the phenomenon is more plausible than this. So that is a further property we'd like our G to have. This is a little bit informal, um, but informally the property we'd like is that for any true statement phi, there is a short explanation pi, such that if you give it to G, G will say, oh, that statement was not so unlikely after all. So for example, if I take the twin prime conjecture, I just gave a heuristic argument that actually with probability one, there are infinitely many twin primes. And so the claim would then be, if there are only finitely many twin primes after all, there must be some short pi, in this case, actually, anyway, some finite length pi at least, that explains why it is that there's only finitely many twin primes, or at least why that's plausible. So if we apply this principle in ML, imagine that we have some model that just has perfect accuracy on some distribution. So for every x, f theta of x is equal to g of x, for every bit string. If you were just pretending that f theta was a random function, which is equal to g independently with probability half on every input, then this would occur with probability 2 to the negative 2 to the n. And as long as the number of parameters is less than 2 to the n, so as long as we didn't have enough parameters to just memorize this data set, this would be an outrageous coincidence. Right, the probability feels like it should be zero. And therefore, there must be some explanation. Right? There must actually be some structural fact about the relationship between f theta and g, which makes it not an outrageous coincidence that they agree all the time. And this is the object we're looking for. So we'd like, this is a property which proofs don't have. It's not the case that if two functions are equal, there's a proof that they're equal. But we hope it's the case for some suitably weak notion of this probabilistic reasoning that whenever two things, whenever a function has a surprisingly large accuracy, there is some explanation for that fact, something someone could point out, some interpretability one could do. Mm -hmm. This is why we're interested in this principle. We would like to have this nice guarantee that if you have a neural net doing something interesting in the lab, there is an explanation for it. Okay, so for the last five minutes, I'll just talk about a theoretical problem, sort of another implication of this principle, um, which I think I find quite interesting and stands on its own. So here's another kind of outrageous coincidence. Suppose that I have a circuit mapping two n inputs down to n inputs. We'll call an input x as 0 if on input x, c of x is all zeros. So for a random function, you should have about 2 to the n zeros. Right? You have 2 to the 2 n inputs. Each of them has a probability of 1 and 2 to the n of being all zeros. Again, if you believe in this no coincidence principle, it should be the case that you never have a circuit with no zeros unless there's an explanation recognized by g. This is analogous to our hope that there should never have a neural net with surprisingly high accuracy without an explanation that's recognized by G. So this leads to the following problem that I, I find very interesting on its own terms. So if we had such a G, we could use it to construct a polynomial time verifier V, which takes as input a circuit together with a proposed explanation for why that circuit should have no zeros. So, so if the circuit in fact has no zeros, there is some explanation that our verifier accepts. So there must be some structure in the circuit that explains why it tends to not have zeros. And our verifier will recognize that and output one. But if we sample a circuit uniformly at random, um, I won't talk about distribution, we can come back to that. Then with very high probability, there's no explanation. So it ought to be the case that if a circuit has no zeros, because that's extremely coincidental, there must be some structure in the circuit that distinguishes it from random. And someone could point out that structure to you. So if, in fact, the kind of heuristic estimator we want exists, then there should be such a, such a V, whereas I think right now we don't know how to construct such a V. Um, I think if you gave me any V, I could easily construct a circuit that will have no zeros but will evade detection by your V. Would you be satisfied with a heuristic argument that says the probability that C has no zeros is at least 10%? Would, would V be for the construction of this V? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think V should just be like, if C is a thousand bit circuit, you should say, well, the probability is more than two to the negative thousand. And then that's enough. Because if you don't do that, you're going to get wrecked by a coincidence, right? This first statement was existentially quantified over every circuit. So V needs to be very, very conservative. Um, yeah. Anyway, so this is for the theorists. This is a problem I'm very interested in. I find it, like, again, apart from the application to neural nets, it seems like it would be very interesting to find such a V. And I think it would capture a lot of the difficulties we're interested in here. Um, so I'd be happy to talk about it. Yeah. Sorry, so does, what's the order of the quantifiers? Do I, does the first thing is to know what V does, and then I pick the circuit? That's right. So you're supposed, we're looking for a V which has this property universally quantified over circuits. So the way the game works is you come to me with a proposal for V, and then I get to either 
exhibit a C, which has no zeros, but which your V doesn't recognize any proof, or I get to exhibit a strategy for producing proofs for random circuits that succeeds with probability more than 1%. I would be very excited if someone could win that game. I mean, we are trying to win that game. This is one of the, one of the things we're up to. I find this, I find the no coincidence principle and this kind of problem like kind of magical. I think this is not the sort of problem we have solved collectively in the past. Right? Proofs do not have this kind of completeness. There's all kinds of structure that proofs miss. And so it'd be very interesting to have this kind of completeness statement. Okay, so stepping back, summarizing this whole story, right? I would love to explain why neural networks work. Proving statements about neural networks seems like it would be really useful, but is intractable. The feasible reasoning seems like it's pretty common and successful in domains where proofs are intractable. It's not formalized. Formalizing it may help scale to neural networks, but it seems right now like a pretty hard problem. And so most of my life is spent on various sub-problems of this problem. Um, and the most ambitious hope is that kind of any interesting neural network behavior, which you can measure in a lab and define precisely, must have some kind of explanation that's recognized by G. And if that was the case, that would be a great step to being able to say, okay, now we have a notion of success for interpretability, which is actually possible for arbitrary models. Cool. That's all I got. Thank you. So I guess going back to G being a neural network, um, let's take, yeah. So can we look at, maybe go to your conjecture? Um, the big conjecture? The, the, the last one you had with the circuits. Right, so I guess I'm wondering, like, uh, is there a way to kind of set up some sort of like generator discriminator, or like some sort of like, kind of like pair of adversarial networks that are basically trying to do this? Like, do you think we could just test this empirically with? Yeah, I think you could play this game. You could play this game either with humans or with neural nets. Let's just say with neural nets. So the way the game works with neural nets is I have initially a neural net that's trained to output one, or let's say it's trained to output zero for random circuits. So for any random circuit in any pi. Then I have an adversary who's trying to produce circuits with no zeros. Um, this part is hard to play because determining a circuit has no zeros is obviously very intractable. You could imagine that the adversary, I don't know. I actually don't know how you set up the game because I don't know how you get circuits you know to have no zeros. But if you imagine you had such an oracle, then you could play this game. OK, I see. So you need some sort of oracle to do that empirical experiment. That's right. I think morally, you could do this experiment with a property like this neural net has accuracy 90%. And the reason you can't do that is like under standard, standard de-randomization conjectures, you could do this in a kind of cheaty way. It doesn't feel like an explanation. The reason we've chosen a thing that's hard to Hard to do, it's like less like what we care about, but it does give us a crisp complexity theoretic implication. And that's why the slightly unnatural setting. Have been missing things here. I'm, I, I guess, uh, is there a place somewhere here for the structure of the data? Uh, in, in terms of that, you know, if, you, if your data is random, for example, the behavior of your neural networks is going to be completely different and probably Nothing is really going to work. So, where does the kind of the structure of the data come in? The natural, you know, the natural image manifold or text manifold or something. Yeah. So the idea is, at the end of the day, what we want to do is like find an explanation for why a neural network works on some distribution, and we could also take an empirical distribution or a finite set of data, and properties of the data distribution, either one that's formally defined or one that's defined by a bunch of examples, will be relevant to that explanation. So your explanation might say, hey, look at all this data. The reason your model works is the data contains the following regularity. Um, and then because of that regularity and the way that it interacts with the weights of your network, the outputs have property P. So the idea is properties of the data set will appear as things that are referenced by this explanation. But shouldn't it also appear somewhere in the, where you compute your coincidence? Because that, shouldn't that be dependent on the data? Yeah, so in some sense, we've defined outrageous coincidence just in terms of what G says. And so sometimes an outrageous coincidence if G thinks it's really, really unlikely. Got it. The, the grokking blog post is the closest I've seen to something almost like a proof. Uh, I'm curious why, like what you think fails there or what's really missing. Yeah, so this is uh, this, this proof question mark or slightly higher resolution, this explanation. Um, so yeah, we start with this informal argument here. I'm not gonna go through the details of the informal argument, but some informal argument that this model correctly does modular addition. I think if you look at that informal argument in these, the most obvious place, I think this maybe becomes a proof with quadratic Sorry, blow up. Why do you call it informal, though? Because, I mean, the, the argument is fine. It's just the connection to the weights, right? 
Yeah, I think so. You could view the argument saying, here's a formal story that a particular algorithm works. So maybe in this column, I have an algorithm that actually works, and I have a proof of that. Mm -hmm. And then I have some claim about how that relates to the weights. And I think so. That claim is is slightly informal, I think, because it just it's quite informal of how it handles the MLP and the the attention layer implementing the nonlinearity. I think that's mostly just empirically estimated. Um, I think you could imagine proving that. I think when you try and prove things like this, you run into saying things like, I have a bunch of vectors. Those vectors have small inner products with each other. And if you try and prove that, the way you prove it is just going to be by exhaustive enumeration. Heuristically, it's very clear why it's true. If you take random vectors, they have small inner products. It's not something that demands explanation. But if you want a proof, I think you need to enumerate exhaustively through basically every pair of vectors to say they have small inner product. And so the size of proof you end up with is going to be essentially the same as the size of the brute force enumeration of inputs. Interesting. Um, so yeah, you could just say it's like a proof, but has a key lemma, which is of these n vectors, no pair has large inner product, which I think is hard to prove, but often very, it's true of random vectors, and it's like kind of the default is for them to not have large inner products. I don't know if that seems fair to the authors as a key leap, but I believe that's an important leap in the proof. Yeah, I mean, I think, so the, like, the direction <laughs> in which each of these identities is implemented is identified. So like there is a claim that like this particular direction in the MLP is like where this computation is happening. I think the thing that is not clear to me at least, although maybe it is clear to Neil, is like how it came to be represented. Like how did the like uh, you know Jellyus like give you give you this? And so that's the place where I think you would need the heuristic yeah. explanation. I think that's right. I think there's a story about how the representation works. That story may be formally completely accurate or like approximately accurate. And then I suspect errors come when you try and actually analyze how it works and how the error propagation works and so on. I expect that's going to be very hard to turn into a proof. Um, there's one person, yeah, I know one person working on trying to do proofs of very small neural networks in this way. So we'll see how good a proof they can actually produce in Cock. I, uh, I wonder, like, suppose that we are chaining a bunch of, like, not very rigorous arguments, but, like, heuristic and intuitively correct arguments together. Will we be able to end up with, like, actually wrong claims because we are, like, adding kind of errors on different steps? Uh, and then, uh, as a result, suppose that we are searching for such a proof, then almost for every kind of statement we can try to justify it with a bunch of, uh, like, informal arguments. And if that's the case, then, like, do we have to so say, for example, prove that G is only unique such that we can avoid such situation? Or like, what do you think is a general strategy to mitigate that? Yeah, so I guess the first question is, once you're doing a bunch of steps that are only probably accurate, how good is your conclusion? And I think that is sort of up to G to say, here was a bunch of steps. Each introduces error and do error propagation. Um, and so we could talk about empirically whether that works well. And this is related to this, this optimistic principle that actually did. If something non-trivial or surprising is happening, you do have to have the model itself has to keep the errors under control. Otherwise, it will converge back to being random. Um, I do think it's probably possible to make an argument for arbitrary wrong conclusions. So this notion of like proofs, you can't prove a wrong thing. I think you can heuristically argue for a wrong thing. And so I think a lot of these statements, you have to be more careful about exactly what you mean. So if someone comes to you, you kind of need to get more arguments, not just one. You're not just trying to be accurate. You're trying to be accurate and then robust to further argument. Can we conclude um, by just asking, uh, this talk was rather theoretical, and your institute's called the Alignment Research Center. I know in your head these are very connected ideas, but I would love to hear, just to finish this off, like what, how do you see the connection? Yeah, so I think the, the connection primarily runs through not liking like training and evaluating neural networks as black boxes. Um, so there is a longer story about like what we would actually do with these explanations, um, which in some sense is why we're doing this, and which I've completely omitted from this talk. I think probably the most like credible way to communicate is to say like, look, a lot of us would like if we had explanations of models, um, and it would be nicer if we understood what we meant by explanation. Um, and so, despite there's a long story about how we're actually going to use these explanations, which is roughly this thing of identifying when an explanation breaks down, using that to flag when something might be going wrong. Um, yeah, it would be great to have explanations. Hopefully, we can use these to flag when something goes wrong by seeing when like the mechanics of the explanation no longer apply. But I think that link is going to be hard to hard to draw quickly. Okay, I'll thank you for